Welcome to Teutonic Takes. Um, I'm your usual co-host here, Fabian Renko, and I'm here with Ivan Ornelas. And we actually have a really special guest today, beloved by Quakes fans and beloved by us, definitely. Um, Quincy Americo, how are you doing, man? I'm doing well, man. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm, ex- I'm excited for today's conversation. Yeah, no, we yeah tr- so am I. We really appreciate your time <laughs> on today. Yeah. Uh, we're we're, we're going to have a blast. Yeah, and before we uh, formally introduce... Uh, Quincy and talk about some of his stats and career. We want to give a thanks to our sponsor, uh, Roughneck Scarves, who do a great job with providing sponsorship for all of the podcasts here on the Beautiful Game Network. So yeah, without further ado, yep, uh, let's uh, see what you have accomplished so far in, in your career because you're still going strong. So uh, <laughs> yeah, you had... Let's hear. <laughs> so, so you started off at a school that's near and dear to my heart since I'm class of 2017 there. Uh, UC Davis from 2006 to 2008, you scored 31 goals in 75 games for the Aggies. And you, were, you started your professional career with the former USL side Bakersfield Brigade, seven appearances, four goals. Oh, wow. And what seems like the, you know, a long time ago in USL since they've now expanded so much and teams have come and gone. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I didn't even know that was a team just to now. I apologize. But, yeah, no, uh, UCL has come a long way if they had a team in Bakersfield. That's for sure. U- USL, yeah. Oh, USL, sorry, yeah. The, US, you, the UCL has come a long way as well. Too, so. <laughs> definitely yeah and then you had your first spell with the San Jose earthquakes in 2009 through the early part of the 2010 season where you made 25 appearances you scored a goal and then you were traded to Colorado Rapids on April 2010 for a second round MLS super draft pick from there you had a pretty decent time with the Colorado Rapids you scored four goals across 37 appearances in all competitions you became an mls champion with the colorado rapids so congratulations on that and it was quite the match it went to extra time with fc dallas as the opponent two teams that few people would have predicted would have made the mls cup that year in 2010 (laughs) people were very upset about that (laughs) (laughs) yeah and uh, it was decided by a george john own goal as well in extra time but also interesting for the Quakes is uh, there's two future San Jose Earthquakes players as, alongside you that were in the match day squads. For uh, FC Dallas, there was Marvin Chavez. And for the Rapids, there was Marvell Wynn, who, mm. like you, have grown to become loved players with the San Jose Earthquakes fans. Do you have a Thank ring, you. Quincy? Do you get a ring? That's <laughs> oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> oh. He's going to bust it out. There's something oh, there. at the bling. That's funny because I feel like we're in, we're living in the matrix. Yeah. And it's just coming together. All these connections are being made and all this stuff is coming together. Uh, fun yeah. fact, Matt Kanji, it was an own goal, but Matt Kanji basically sacrificed his ACL on that play. Oh. Right? So oh, yeah. ACL on that play. So if you go look at the that game-winning goal, he threw his leg into basically the lion's den and and Taurus ACL, and everyone thought he was, like, faking or hurting his injury, and they found out afterwards it was, it was, um, <laughs> it was torn. Wow. And you've got Marvell Wynn, right? He, have, he had mm-hmm. to officially retire earlier because he had to get that heart surgery. Yeah. Right. Yeah, surgery. that was very unfortunate. And I don't know, maybe I, maybe I lost it. But funny, I, I was reaching into my bag here yesterday, and I, I thought I pulled it out. Or maybe not. For all you guys on Patreon that can see this video, he's he's trying to pull out his ring. <laughs> uh, I'm, trying, I'm trying to find it. Uh, it's okay if you can't find it. I'm uh, sure well, it's, it's in the back. Uh, here we go. It's in the back. Here, oh, it, is. here it is. Very lucky. I'm very surprised. I think my son tried to 
my son took it out of the uh yeah, wow. my son took it out of, and uh I'm not okay. <laughs> no, that's what I was gonna say. My son took it out of the bag and I think I found it, I saw it on the ground, and I was like, Oh, I better put that somewhere. Yeah. So, uh, before I forget. And I tossed it in my bag, so then I haven't seen it in years. So there's a reason why he, he found it and it was laying out. It was so you guys could ask about it. But yeah, yeah. there's that. There's the room. All right. There That's you all. go. You had to pay for it or was it paid for? Like what, what happened? I, it was paid for, but it, uh, I think you talked about it before we got on this. But the Quakes, uh, well, I'm saying the Quakes owner is not too, uh, is not the most. Uh, uh, you can say with, with this. <laughs> well, I was trying to think of the word. It's not as liberal with the spending as, you know, <laughs> other teams and stuff. <laughs> Colorado definitely wasn't that liberal with their spending of right. us winning. Right. <laughs> as much as nobody was expecting us to win, I'm pretty sure. Uh, uh Kronky wasn't expecting us to win that either uh i i have to, i like to think that i'm the only person in like history who's won a championship but their first name is on the ring because they're just oh like, wow yeah, oh wow their last name so it was <laughs> yeah okay yeah, that's, that's pretty cool long, right <laughs> yeah, so look it makes for a good story right so like I I liked I was thinking like you know what Ameriquad maybe is too long that's why they didn't do it or they were scared they're gonna mess up the last name but then <laughs> I think I saw Jeff's ring and Laurentowitz was on his so I was like okay, oh okay I see how it is but it's all good man <laughs> oh yeah good times with the with the Rapids I really enjoyed my time there um, a lot of the guys on that team ended up being uh, groomsmen at my wedding so oh, oh that's great congratulations on that as well and. Um, how old are your, your kids, by the way? You mentioned them. Boys. So, uh, Sir is three years old, and Lord is like almost a, almost a year and a half. So, oh, wow. what is six, 16, 17 months now, or almost, yeah, almost a year and a half. So, did you get married All after right. your time at the Quakes? Uh, no, I got married. So, yeah, you put me on the spot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, Serena and I have been married for a little over three years. Okay. Three and a half. Wait. Yeah. Now, now you really put me on the spot. <laughs> we got two. We got two kids under three in the middle of a pandemic and a free agency year, trying to figure out what's going on. You, right. you don't know what it is. I'm just happy. Yeah. I'm happy. I, I I showed up in time for this podcast, man. <laughs> we got going on. Uh, yeah. Serena. Yeah. I, I met Serena and I met back in uh, at UC Davis. So I've known Serena and we've been. Oh, there you go. I was 17. We started dating. Uh, when I was 21 and then, you know, we got married three and a half or so years ago. So, mm. so yeah, <laughs> UC Davis connection, you know? <laughs> yeah. My girlfriend, she's a UC Davis class of 2019. So it's a uh, magical place. <laughs> <laughs> See, now we're not, we need to go and get uh hit up UC Davis for some money. Cause it sounds like we're just letting them sponsor this podcast. Huh? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll give a uh, CSU East Bay some love. No. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> all good, man. You got to slip. You got to shout him out. You know what I mean? Yeah, right. That's good. Yeah, man. yeah. Uh, so uh, back to uh, your uh, MLS career. So you had a brief spell in Toronto FC in 2012. Uh, hopefully, brief enough that the Montreal Impact fans didn't mind too much. Well, but we'll get to that. <laughs> uh -huh. Fun fact: before that, an even briefer spell with New York Red Bulls because I signed with them under Hans Baca and uh the day I had signed Ryan Johnson had reached out to me because Paul Mariner uh was interested because their Ford had gone down I talked to Hans Baca because my contract would be up at the end of the year and that's where Henri Cahill they just signed uh Se Sebastian Latou that was mm. his name yes. oh yeah. Uh, yeah so so they weren't expecting to want to sign me because the story of my career is nobody's expecting me to be good when I show up and then all of a sudden they're surprised <laughs> and then they to figure out a way to keep me or keep me around and they don't really know how so then the conversation with Sam was like look my contract would be up at the end of the year you guys weren't expecting me right it's probably better that I go there and be a starter and get some minutes and games yeah then number four here behind obviously some very prolific uh forwards in the league uh so then that was the plan I went to Toronto the short spell in Toronto uh, thought I finally found 
you know, the coach that was, that was saying, Hey, we're going to build a team. This is awesome. This is what I was waiting for. And I was super juiced. And then they fired Paul Mariner at the end of the year. And then he went into broadcasting and I, then, uh, then the next part, which I'm sure you're getting to is I went to Chicago. So yeah. Yeah. 2013 to 2015 with Chicago fire, you scored 11 goals in 60 appearances. And I feel like you definitely were on the map more throughout MLS sit through your uh, contributions to that club and then on June 2015 Chicago Fire traded uh, you to the San Jose Earthquakes the yeah. Earthquakes gave them Ty Harden and Ty Harden he was a serviceable defender he only yeah. made three appearances for the Fire so I'm pretty satisfied with how that turned out for the Quakes, <laughs> the quakes uh-huh. yeah they, they got a steal there I mean they got a, a starter an impactful player for a person that never barely saw the field in Chicago Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then overall in your two uh, quick spells combined, you have uh, 10 goals in 85 appearances, which is very great. For And I remember you scored some goals in some opportune times, which is always great too. But it's always, it's always helpful, and uh, I'm sure <laughs> we'll talk about it more. I think the way in which I learned how to survive in – the professional game was I had realized that <clears throat> for me to get my opportunities, my focus had to be on like creating chances and mm-hmm. holding the ball for my teammates. So uh, it, it, even hearing you read the stats, right? Most people say you're forward. Those numbers aren't very strong or prolific. Right. Mm-hmm. And I, I, right. I love, I love this setup because <laughs> then I can go, because then I can say, okay, uh, I think over 200, 200 appearances, like 220 appearances in MLS. Right. Mm-hmm. I think 98 starts, 26 yeah. total goals, 22 assists, 10 pe- or 11 penalties drawn, all of which resulted in a goal. So if you add them up that way, in 98 starts, that was over, what was that, 24, was that 30, 50, 61 goals or something like that, in 98 yeah. starts. And then when you look at it that way, people then go, oh. <laughs> and go like, yeah. yeah. Okay. And then on top of that, you're saying the years in which I, I, I played and I was a contributing starter where I had the starting position, I was at least the most or the second most fouled player in the league. Yeah. Which creates a set piece opportunities in the offensive third of the field. And you don't get credit for goals scored off of those as well, too. Yeah. So we approach the game a little bit different, man. <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, I was worried I, I was going to bore I, you. I, with I love it. Stats. I love it. <laughs> I was afraid I was going to bore you with these stats, but you took it to the next level, and I do yeah. appreciate that. So even with forwards, especially with other positions in the field, goals in the system don't always tell the whole story because there's so many different roles when it comes to soccer. But even within the attacking players, there's more than one ways to be efficient as an attacking player, and you definitely demonstrated that throughout your career. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And I, I think we talked a little bit about that before we'll get into that in terms of there's, there's always more to the story than, than the stats and the numbers, right? Yeah. And um, how you tell the story is just as important as, yeah, is, if, is more important. And that's the, that's the lesson of my professional career that I learned. Mm. Because right. how people tell the story can completely change how you perceive someone. Wow. So, right. Yeah, so yeah. That's, that's my advantage in playing, uh, playing the game because I know how people perceive my stats and numbers who don't know me and haven't watched me play. Right. right, right. So that's that's the balancing act of surviving professional sports. Mm. Right, and the reason that I do this section for all the players we interview is, if anything, that these numbers, while some of them may be more misleading than others, they at least jog the memory because even for players that we love and we follow throughout their careers, it's tough to remember everything. So this is one of my favorite parts of preparing for these podcasts uh, is going through and uh, compiling a bit of a, you know, spark notes version. And then we go into the lengthier version through this conversation. Yeah, no, I love it. No, no, it's great. It's a great jumping off point because even when I'm hearing you read it back, I can now see how those who might not have as much experience, haven't watched the the league, don't know the full stories behind stuff, they haven't gotten fully immersed in it yet. Right. We're changing soccer culture. It's going to happen, right? I can see how they might get uh, – they're not getting the full picture 
mm. right? And they're not getting mm-hmm. the other nuances and ways in which you could really dive into the game, right? So right. hopefully I'm doing my part to create uh, that 4D game of chess that everyone can, uh, <laughs> can go down the rabbit hole in, maybe in alignment with, with the background, right? It would take people into outer space. Yeah. Yeah, ride that wave. <laughs> so you 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 did a very good job with hold up play while your time as a player, and now you're doing hold up play for your uh, like for soccer culture. You know, it's it's just this is you. This this is Quincy right here. <laughs> <laughs> I'd said uh uh maybe if I'd said it for a while, but I was thinking when I did the interview with the Cooligans. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, after the game against, I think it was, I think it was against the New England Revolution. Uh, I'd, I'd scored the goal. I got man of the match in that game. Um, uh, might have been a conspiracy because I happened to do that goal <laughs> at the right time because I was going to be on their podcast after, afterwards. I said, my focus <laughs> is being the, the greatest teammate of all time. And I think the whole room was just like, what? What does that even make? I'm like, ah, don't worry about it. We'll fe- Everyone will find about it soon. The approach is different, but we'll see what happens, you know? Right. So, uh, no, I appreciate you guys saying that because I've, I've been trying my best, man. I'm doing as much as I can. and <laughs> the, I, I, think, yeah. I think it works, but I usually don't find out if it works until like year, two, three years late after the fact. Right, you know? right. Because right. we're talking about showing up and making change. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a change it takes time, takes investment, takes time exactly. for people – to get on board and to be willing and to dive into it. And you know, I mean, yeah. that's why I really respect the work that you guys are doing. You're, you, you're doing the podcast because you're passionate about it. Uh, you love the community. You love Thank the you. game. <laughs> the fact that, you know, you're, you're doing your own research to find the stats and figure out the story and then come and then ask the questions, you know, you're integral part of that process, part of the story of the league, building the culture, you know what I mean? So like, I love it. And I, 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 uh, I appreciate the work you guys are doing. Cause I think a lot of people are going to really appreciate it. You know, I, I know hardcore fans are going to appreciate it right now. Who are yeah. always, who are always new, you know what I mean? Um, but then, you know, the subsequent fans that are coming a year later, two exactly. years later, mm-hmm. three years later, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. These conversations I think become more and more valuable as time goes on because we get to share a very unique perspective that not a lot of people get to experience firsthand right. or at very least, you know, have the conversation. So I'm loving what you guys are doing, man. It's cool. Oh, thanks Quincy. Thank you. <laughs> that makes me feel great. You know, a lot of butterflies. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm in awe. This is a great feeling. Um, and then to your uh, most recent years in your career, in August 2018, you were traded to Montreal Impact in exchange for the fashionable and fast Dominic Oduro. Yes. And then you played in DC United in 2019 season where you had 23 appearances, you scored a goal. And then most recently in September 1st, uh, 2020, I believe, you signed with the Las Vegas Lights in time to uh, help with the uh, closing stretch of the USL season. Unfortunately, Las Vegas uh, didn't qualify for the playoffs. Obviously, yep. not your fault because you joined late, so no worries. And <laughs> I, take then, uh, blame. I take a little blame. I, oh, not a little. I take, I take a lot because it's, it's your ability to try to understand what's going on and help the team as quickly as possible. Mm. And mm-hmm. uh, my understanding of what I was going into was set, but then two days before I showed up, there was an even massive issue with the team that kind of set another another realm of spirals. So oh, wow. that was a great experience. It was a great experience for me because it just it further helps me develop the the approach and understanding. And there's always something new to learn. Um, uh, but yeah, man, I, I guess that's been my mindset and mentality. You know what I mean? Like, if I knew everything to do and how to do it right, I could have solved for that problem. But I'd never seen that problem before, so it was right. Like, and now and, I understand it and I, it'll help me, you know, as I'm moving forward, but mm. yeah. Yeah. It was an interesting format this season as well. And with the way that the groups were split up too, Las Vegas did have its uh, work cut out for them because they're in a group with Phoenix rising, LA galaxy Two, orange County and San Diego loyal who they were trading blows left and right. It was a very wild finish to see who f- would make the playoffs Phoenix Rising and LA Galaxy 2 ultimately did, uh, partially due to some 
situations involving San Diego Loyal, which we could go into detail later. But um, ultimately, as of now, the first round of USL playoffs have concluded, and Phoenix Rising is the last uh, team standing from that group after a uh, 1-0 extra time win over Sacramento Republic. And in lastly about your career, the club you made you played for made the playoffs four times, 2010, 2011, 2017, and 2019. And there was a few near misses, just barely on goal difference with Chicago Fire in 2013, and two times by four points with San Jose Earthquakes in 2015 and Montreal Impact in 2018. And I think that shows that you've made a positive impact more often than not, which is one of the best attributes you can have in a player. So overall, I think I, yeah, I we can. I appreciate that. That's very. <laughs> see, you butterflies and make me feel good about that. <laughs> People see that or or give much credit for that. So no, I I appreciate that. I think um, you saying that the one that hurt the most. I think. And sorry, uh, Quakes fans. <laughs> right. I'm honest, right? The one that hurt the most was the Montreal Impact one because mm-hmm. uh, yeah. Traded there, you know, uh, Remy Gard, right, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. was the head coach at the time. Similar to what I had referenced before, most of the time coaches are trading for me and bringing me in because things weren't, aren't going well where they're at. Mm-hmm. They want a fighter or someone that they know what they're going to get. They're not really expecting much out of me. Uh, that's, that's just what it is, and that's how it works. But then I, can, I get to come in, learn quickly, figure it out. You know, he, you know the French system is very different. Uh, it was interesting. It was fun. I enjoyed it. I really liked uh, Montreal, and I felt like I I, um, I connected and got jailed in well with the the coaching staff and the team really quickly mm-hmm. to the point that we were going on a on a really massive run. We were doing really well. Uh, we lost the most important games. So most of all those games were were the most important game was DC United in DC. That was when they, you know, Rooney had just kind of got there. They were going on their home, run, uh, their home field run. And that's my first time seeing that, you know. And when it's your first time seeing something, um, uh, oh, this, that's good because he's thinking about it. It's <laughs> seeing something for the first time. It's trying to articulate and describe it, right? Because these are things that you learn as a veteran and you've been in the game for a long time, right? You, you, when you're seeing something new for the first time, you know the things that you go to and you know what you can rest on and what you can do. But what I've really been learning and better understanding this last year and a half or two years is how guys who might not have that experience yet react to it. Mm. Right? So like, mm-hmm. I might not have seen that before, but I know what to do when it's something I don't see. But if your teammates don't know that Got and it. you don't know how to communicate that to them, you're not, in my opinion, how I look at it, not being the best teammate that you can be. You're not being the best teammate of all time because you're not recognizing in the moment that that's the time you need to now talk to your teammates and get on the same page as to what it is that you're looking at. Cause your focus is on, okay, let me pay attention here. You know? So that yeah. means you're, you're, you're not, your, your attention is being focused in uh, anyway, long, long story on that. Right. And I'm sure uh, maybe on another episode we could talk more. Yeah, uh, definitely. About that. Right. Right. So you're really looking at it with teams, their, their, their organizations, their systems of play. So you're looking for how to exploit the other team's system. Yeah, exactly. Right? If it's the first time you're seeing the system, then your mental capacity has to be dedicated to figuring out that system as quickly right. as possible. Right. And then once you understand that, you have to process that information, condense it down and then pass the message back to your team. Exactly. And then your team has to be in agreement and alignment that we see the same thing or we all at least agree to attack or defend it in a particular way. Hmm. Right. Okay. So it's really a network of communication and your ability to pass information quickly in a way that everyone can understand, knowing that there's multiple levels in experience, personal experience. Like some guys only have five games, professional experience. Others right. have 200, some have 300, some like the coach, some don't like the coach. Some are mad at the fans. Hmm. Some are mad at the owners. <laughs> Some are mad at each other. Yeah. Some are in awe of the person across from them who they're playing against because they looked up to them their whole entire career. Right. Okay. Some didn't get enough sleep the night before. Some didn't <laughs> eat enough food. There's so many variables and so many things. And these are all things that you're accounting for in the moment and needing to process and then make a centralized uh, message. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, it's so, just, I like so, it. Yeah, uh, yeah, no. But it's a, so thinking through all those things, we lost what what was the most important game of that entire run. We won all the games we needed to. We went on a massive run. We should have all everything would have said, "Hey, we're going to playoffs." But as you know, in MLS, right? Yeah. As you know. And, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. We lost the most in crucial games. So that's why I'm saying like that one was the one that hurt the most because that was the one where I was, I thought, yeah, all figured out. We know what we're doing. And then that's when life comes and slaps you in the face and says, come on, you don't know. You don't know right. <laughs> so in that season in particular, like a brief tangent to talk about DC United, Mm-hmm. Their season changed drastically when Wayne Rooney dra- he came to the club, and then when he scored his first goal in late July in a win over Colorado Rapids. Following that game, DC United only lost two games the rest of the regular season, and when they beat Montreal Impact as well, they that was the start of a five-game winning run to close the season, along with a zero-zero draw against Chicago Fire. So. MLS is a beast sometimes, and you just never know what's going to happen. And everyone's got a plan until you get punched in the face, unfortunately. Exactly. And if you're, if people really want to go super nerded out and down the conspiracy rabbit hole, right? You can oh, go yeah. Look, okay. You can go look at the first sequences of play in that game and how we could have and should have uh, been up by one goal. I passed the ball. Uh, into the center of the box to uh, in the box to Bach, who had an easy, an easy tap in, but uh, I don't think he was expecting it. And he's a right back. And he was basically, mm. how did I get myself into this position? I'm going like, exactly. This is perfect. <laughs> Let's go. And uh, he hit it straight to Bill Hamid. And then I just think, uh, I think we got overwhelmed by the moment because collectively we didn't have enough playoff run experience. Mm. That's just, you know, from my mm-hmm. perspective, because there's things we were doing, that I didn't understand at the time, which means I didn't have enough experience to know what was going on, Mm. which is why when I'm expressing to you here now, upon self-reflection, I realize it's, I didn't, that's what I didn't know. Right. And that then is how and where in my mind, you know, Wayne was able to exploit many systems of play on that run because he had seen all of this stuff before. Right. So like he knows what to do and how to adjust it. But there's also limitations to that because MLS will throw something at you that you haven't seen before. And that's why MLS, in my mind, is the most difficult league to navigate yeah. in the world because, because of all the rules, all the, all the variables, all the, yeah. you know, the caps, the no pro rel, the news cycle, literally, it all comes together. So, um, yeah, no, that was yes. that was a that was a good experience. And then I eventually subsequently signed with DC. I, I tend to think the reason why I ended up signing with DC is because they saw me play in that game and saw yeah. how I performed. Uh, uh, my boy, uh, brilliant, right? Go check out the mm-hmm. man, put on this man in the corner uh, late in the game. That's my boy. I give him a, I'm in, I give him a, I'm in your head a shout. Uh, <laughs> but I think they saw from that game. That's what, opened up the opportunity for DC to eventually offer me a uh, uh, post season when uh, uh, Montreal had wanted me back. But again, because of all the rules within the league, it yeah. has to work out perfectly. It didn't work out. And then I ended up signing with DC. So I know we, we t- we've been <laughs> right. That's what I was giving you guys. Hey, yeah, here's some other backstory and other stuff along that. No, journey. it's good. It's good. This is a soccer okay, cool. philosophy with Quincy Americo. I love it. I love it. This is good. Like <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, so, we're, we went into your career. We saw a little bit of almost everything. You kind of broke it down perfectly for us. Um, let's talk a little bit about your youth now. I mean, let's talk about your kind of your career growing up. Um, mm-hmm. Where were there a lot of fans where you grew up in Bakersfield? Did you soccer feel like fans? There was a big soccer presence? Oh uh, no, not at the time. Not when I was growing up. But mm. uh, I've talked about it kind of on the blog and on the podcasts. And um, you know what my experience with it is. My my father's Nigerian, right? So soccer's mm-hmm. the biggest sport in everywhere else in the world, other than America, right? So that's how I was introduced to the sport. What I what I would basically do is we'd have 
what we call Nigerian League, which mm. is basically uh, uh, a weekly game at the local college. At the time when I was growing up, we tended uh, it, we tended to go to Cal State Bakersfield, and there was fields and stuff there, and it turns into a huge. Usually starts out as like five v five, and then grows into like eighty v eighty with wow. two, like, two, you know, like two by five goals, like. 150 yards apart so yeah. there's like two or three guys like standing on the standing in the goal so it's <laughs> almost like it's almost like nearly impossible to score right. uh but it's a uh, anyone who's coming by if you show up it's a free and open to play you know and that's where i basically hold my skills right you're playing with people as young as three and four years old right all the way up to like 85 years old are all <laughs> on the field and uh yeah, when I think about it more and more, yeah, I was introduced to so many different styles of play and so many different approaches. Right. And you had to figure out how to try to score and participate and play and get the ball and all that stuff. I'd say that was extremely influential. So the soccer community wasn't huge, but it was a tight knit community. And um, uh, that's kind of what what got it going. Then I joined an AYSO team and then eventually my my club team with Bakersfield Alliance where I spent a majority of my entirety of like my club um, wow. career uh, while doing high school soccer yeah. uh, with Liberty Liberty uh, at the time. I think my freshman year I played JV, um, um, did well my, my freshman year. Then my sophomore year I made varsity and like didn't play at all. Hmm. And then junior, senior year, I, I played my junior and senior year in, in high school. Okay. So, yeah, so your father was Nigerian and your mother, I believe, was Native American and German, was it? Yeah, so my, my, my mother's from Superior, Montana, population mm -hmm. 1,500. Right? <laughs> oh. My, my father's from uh, Oweri, Nigeria. So, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, my grandfather was born and raised on um, reservation, and then my grandmother was born... She was born in Montana because my great grandmother and grandfather immigrated from from Germany. So we got to work on getting me that German passport. Man. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, guys, got to help make that happen so I could go play in Europe. Right. <laughs> I wanna hear yeah. well, we'll see. Yeah, um, well, uh, a lot of uh, American players are doing well in, in all levels of the German uh, football system there. So. Who knows? That could be in your future. <laughs> hey, hey, we've seen crazier things happen, guys. You right. never know. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's true. Well, happy belated Indigenous Day, right? So yesterday. Yeah, Indigenous so. People's Day. Yep. Yeah. It was just, that was, yeah, that just passed. And I saw uh, Quakes did a bunch of stuff with Wanda for that. Yeah. And then I think uh, Wanda was also in the voting initiative video with BPC um, as well, too. So it's cool to see the connections of, you know, my teammates and where everybody's at in their careers, what they're focused on, what they're doing and yeah. um, how it's all coming together. It's really cool to see. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so since uh, you and I, we both came from UC Davis, I do have a couple of questions uh, regarding that time. Was there a particular game or soccer moment that stood out to you in your collegiate career? Um, I'd say the time, our huge rivals was UC Santa Barbara. Right, because mm -hmm. when I first got to UC Davis, we were Division Two that was transfer mm -hmm. transferring to Division One. So even if we qualified, we weren't allowed to go to the tournament. So that was our right. focus in the first year. And uh, Santa Barbara didn't have a football team. I believe they still don't have a football team, right? Mm. And we were always seen as the misfits, is like we're not good enough, and you guys suck, which is great because that just <laughs> that's my ego. Like I'm like, yeah, I suck, but I won. So what does that say about you? So. <laughs> Uh, but that was a great rivalry. The one, I think the one that stood out most to me was when we played um, at uh, at Santa Barbara. My grandparents. So I have um, I have three sets of grandparents, right? My mom, mm -hmm. my mom's pa parents, uh, my dad's parents, and then basically my my adopted grandparents, uh, Ann and Rick Dixon. Love mm -hmm. love them to death. They so my grandparents mm -hmm. were at that game with my dad um, uh, and my mom. 
And in that game, I had scored the collegiate goal of the year as a bicycle kick, and then I had scored another goal. So I think we won the game like 2-1, and we won it on the bicycle kick that I scored there. And I remember because I was like – I was running and uh, uh, pointing at them. So that was, really, that was a really great moment for them to see. And then the thing that I remember is uh, Julian Godinez – with sprinting basically on the field, but he was on the bench and I think he got like a yellow card for it. So you could see, the, yeah, you can see the YouTube clip cause it's still up um, and you'll see him running, swinging his arm. Those are good. Time. I really like, I love the guys on the, the UC Davis team as well. So that would be the, probably the one that stands out to me most. Right. Despite being a small town, I, whenever I talk to people who aren't familiar with Davis, even some family members of, about the town it's even though it's in between the bay area and sacramento because there's the cities are more spread out in between people think oh it's just a rural redneck town nothing happens there but uh because it is still close proximity with these major hubs and during my time at uc davis granted i went to school a few years uh, after you had graduated and started playing mls uh, i felt like it definitely had a good soccer culture there was several restaurants where they would show games for the World Cup, for the Champions League, for other big events. And there is always people playing pickup soccer, whether it be the indoor soccer in the gym or in the fields as well. There is a few set up uh, about across the street from the football field too. So yep. it was definitely a lot of fun. Uh, and a lot of the soccer friends I talked to today – and we have like a group chat, like I met through UC Davis. Do you feel like that was a similar experience for you? Yeah. I mean, even you saying that was making me go like, oh yeah, no, that was my experience as well too, right? There was a lot of, um, I guess you don't think of it as, was there great soccer culture in Davis until I'm thinking about it now relative to other places I've been, right? right? So relative mm -hmm. to other places, now that you're saying that, I go like, yeah, actually, there is a very strong soccer culture. Um, and, yeah, there's strong soccer culture in Davis. Like, because I'm mm -hmm. thinking, yeah, there's, you've got the intramurals. So there's all the mm -hmm. intramurals. Uh, there's multiple fields across from the, the football stadium that like you're talking about. I'm even thinking yeah. about the indoor at the Arc. Yeah, yeah the Arc. Yeah. yeah. I and, worked at the Arc for three years. Okay, there you go. And, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, then you've got the field itself, which is right next to the baseball field. But they also did the wrap with the like, uh, the soccer. Uh, yeah, yeah. You're you're making me think about them. Like, yeah, <laughs> now that I think about it, the soccer culture in Davis was like massive. You know, <laughs> and, and even when you're saying now you're in WhatsApp groups with guys uh, and girls who played soccer, and that culture is still going. And now you're having a podcast talking about soccer. We're talking about building soccer culture. Yeah. I'm realizing what, you know what I mean? I'm going like, oh, whoa. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think what uh, stands out for me, places, whether it be states or regions or cities, uh, which areas have the soccer cultures that thrive the most is when I go to games, where the fans like, is it whether it's packed? It, if it's packed with loud fans, is it packed with quiet fans? Is it sparse, but like all 300 fans that are there are really into it? Uh, are there games on at restaurants and people aren't asking to switch to college football or anything or golf? Yeah. golf. <laughs> so all these things, you know, uh, play that's, a factor. That's interesting. So that what that made me do is make now I'm questioning you because uh, uh, you have an experience and perspective that I'm realizing now I haven't gotten the opportunity to fully immerse myself in. And that's the fan experience. Right. Because right? I'm always entering the space as a pro. As right. A player. So I'm thinking about how to create a great fan experience through interaction one-on-one, -on -one, right? Because when I'm starting out, people weren't saying like, well, just like you're saying right now, well, are people switching the channel from from so from soccer to golf and stuff? Well, when I'm starting out, no one's even thinking of turning t golf on, right? Yeah. So, so, right. So, let alone there, it's on the TV and people want it on and they're talking about it. And now they're talking about like, do we attend the games and are we coming with tifos and are we making this and are we doing that and yeah. are we doing the tailgate and all that kind of stuff, you know? So, 
no, that's really, that's really, that's cool to hear. So how has that, how has that progressed for you? Like, what are you, do you see it just getting bigger and bigger? Do you, like, how, how would you describe it? I feel like it's in, in the places I've lived, I've lived in the Bay area, in the Sacramento area, in college at UC Davis. And now I live in the San Diego area. Uh, I, I'm seeing subtle improvements and greater fan interest across the board, not just because places like San Diego are getting USL teams now, but also just because more and more people are talking about it. Every year I feel like more people that I know that aren't really soccer fans are like, oh, hey, are you excited for the World Cup or something like that? Or even like if it's a random international friendly like this past weekend where there were some big matchups – that they, maybe they bring it up and I think that's the biggest indicator of growth for me is an, an acknowledgement that soccer is being broadcast it's being introduced to more and more people's lives and it's slowly but surely climbing up some rankings in terms of like people are diehard football fans primarily but maybe soccer is becoming their number three or number four and by versa for other sports i think it's cool i think the biggest thing is going to be to make that bigger i think the tv rights and having games on the correct times and the correct dates i think makes a huge difference oh yeah absolutely when you can plan a tailgate and make it a social event i think that that's huge i think when people are enjoying even the aspect outside of the game when they're at the game is going to be huge and lasting a memory in in soccer for them got you that makes sense that's that's making me think like we've been operating trying to fill the space that nobody wants because it's probably the cheapest and that's available and the diehards make it work right but we need more casual fans and to do that you got to make access more convenient right exactly Mm -hmm. okay no, no, I, I, I hear you on that. I agree. I, I agree with that. And I understand that. And then even the early indicators that you're talking about in terms of once people are bringing something up on their own, that's a completely different dynamic than you trying to convince them why it's, in, why it's important that they should care. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Great. And that's like great. maybe 15 years ago, uh, soccer would be brought up as something niche, like the winter Olympics or something. But now I feel like it's being considered more and more like a major league, which it is on a similar wavelength to NHL or MLB, um, NBA and NFL as well, although those are two very massive entities still. But um, major league soccer is carving out its own identity and that's doing great for this country. Although there's still things that we would want to improve that's always going to be the case regardless of what country you live in and what sport you follow. Yeah, no, I, agree. I, agree. I think, I think uh, this is purely my opinion, but I think if the MLS kind of took the college football approach and made it so that they have a certain day where it's games every single day or every single Saturday, let's say, or every single Friday, and they had a set time for every single time you pop on the game at five o'clock and then you have a pregame show, all that good stuff. Then you start to create a bigger culture and a following just for the casual fan that knows that, Hey, there's going to be a soccer game at 10. It's going to be Atlanta United versus Nashville. But wow, look at that place just bumping, right? I mean, you have 70,000 people going crazy. The average casual fan would be like, Whoa, what's going on here? I know at 10 o'clock Saturday, we're going to be playing another game. I'm just maybe popping on or something like that. And that's where I think the MLS lacks with getting viewership. Got yeah. you. I, I, I hear you on that. And I will add that to, I'll add that to the feedback document, bro. And I'll make yeah. sure that that's brought to, <laughs> to the appropriate people. Oh, appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, let's, 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 let's be real. College football is not the top tier sport, right? It's, NFL yeah, and they still have a cult following. They still have a whole bunch of people that feel attached to their school that they went to, or they feel attached for some reason to college football, which the MLS should definitely look into what they're doing. Cause evidently we're not going to be the best league for a little while if we become it. So we yes. definitely need to see what type of things, how can we make the clubs rooted into people? And I think we'll get into this later. I think that has to do with, 
kind of the money spent as well. I mean, how do you, how do you get people interested in something that is brand new and has to be a brand new car, right? You, you get a flashy new car. It looks nice. You go ahead and look at it because it's, it's nice and expensive. Right. So that's just a kind of, a- I, I'm, okay. No, but this is good. I, I, I like that. I like where this is going. Cause then we're really talking about more. The importance is, is where is the best dollar invested? Right. Yeah. And, uh, and what's most difficult I think for fans as well as ownership and everyone to fully wrap your head around is the fact that what we see today isn't the result of the work we did yesterday. It's the result of the work we did maybe 10 years ago. So yeah. the decision we made 10 years ago and the work we did is, is what we're experiencing now. And then based on what we're seeing, we're making the decision on what we'll do today, but we won't see those results for 10 years from now. Right. Right. So, yeah. so if we're looking at it from, from that perspective, I'm, I hear you and I, and I'm in alignment in terms of saying like, Hey, there's something that college football has tapped into you. Yeah. Right. That, proves that you don't need to be the top tier and the top echelon of sport exactly. to have that cult following the money, the viewership, the, the dedication, the tie. Exactly. What is that specifically? Right. And it should be not easy, but it should be doable for us to do that for soccer, considering the market of young kids that the wave of kids that are coming in that exactly. mm-hmm. love the sport. And now it's really saying like, Hey, Oh, and I talk this to a lot of players and guys in the locker room. I say, Hey, what got you here? Won't get you there. Yeah. Right. So investing in the DP and pulling all the talent from international to get that attention, like that new car that you're talking about. Exactly. Was really about eyeballs there and people here. And that's where I really look at like the American player, the domestic player, they built the league. So it was built on the back of those players, right? Yeah. Hey, shiny new object, pay attention to us undervalued the American player. They're not smart. They call it soccer, not football. They don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah. Yada, yada, yada. Right. So you're completely underselling, undervaluing the domestic American player. And maybe 10 years ago. Yes. Right. But now those players are here 10 plus years later. Exactly. To still call those guys dumb, undervalued, don't understand the game. That's a mistake. One that I think the international market is not making. That's why they're poaching and picking up all of our best American talent right? and taking them overseas. And you're seeing that they're, they're excelling and doing very well overseas mm-hmm. because the uh, American mentality and mindset hasn't been, uh, I'd say uh, the young American mentality mindset of the top echelon guys who are getting taken over there are going, knowing they have something to prove and something they've been working for their whole lives, but they haven't also been made complacent with huge contracts of money and all right. the, you know, all the, all the stuff that comes along with it. So like exactly. there's pros and cons um, to that. And, and I think because American soccer is still early in its maturity, we see it as extremely, Oh, look, we need the attention and exposure of selling our young talent and yeah. overseas to legitimize that we're not, the terrible league that can't develop talent like everybody is calling us. Right. But in in doing so you're giving up some of your most valuable talent talent to bring in outside uh, individuals. And that's great. But if those outside individuals are coming in and they're not building connections with the local communities, they're not becoming a part of the fabric of that organization. Yeah. Now you're, 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 uh, you're undermining your own growth. You're under, and that's what I think a mistake that MLS is making right now because I don't see, and you, this is where you guys could correct me if I'm wrong, right? Yeah. I don't see most international guys coming in and staying like a Chara, like a Valeri. Mm. Mm-hmm. They're, yeah. Okay, you went and signed this huge DP player. He's been there eight plus years. His family's there. Right. They have a home there. They're probably going to be there well after they're done. You know what I'm saying? That's different than right. a, you know, big name player. You're signing, splash, cool, in and out. Yeah, you know? exactly. No, I, yeah, I understand that. Think, yeah, so it's tying into what you're talking about in terms of building that get building that connection because that yeah. connection is very important, right? And it's depending on what do you value right now. You value, you know what I mean? 
what do you, you, you value that new flashy car that's going to break down and cost you a lot of money to, to right. fix up when it's not working or old reliable, you know, that's always going to get you from point A to point yeah. B. Maybe it's not as flashy. Yeah. Right. Like LA galaxy. Yes. Yeah. LA galaxy this last year. And then now Portland, I mean, look at LA galaxy. They had to fix up that lineup and they added something like a, a very expensive engine in Chicharito and they're not, they're not what they are. So, but look at Portland being consistently good throughout Valeri's DP years and yes. kind of to like bring it back to what we were talking about with the why college football, the kind of experience is what MLS needs. Everybody loves going to college football games. If MLS had that, let's say the culture of college football is what makes that sport relevant. I think that's just my opinion because all the game day posters, all the partying, all the tailgates. But the problem with MLS is they don't have set date. I guess I, my biggest issue is the set days. Because if you have, let's say, Saturday soccer, right? Everybody knows, oh, the Saturday's coming up, there's a game. Maybe have the mm-hmm. Wednesday game, some in between, but still have always on Saturday. I think having a primetime game on Saturday and a whole bunch of slated games always improves viewership. Like we saw sometimes on Rivalry Week, I think they have Saturday completely – just booked and that's i think a little bit consistency decision with day as well at the end yeah. of the season exactly yeah, I think things like are, that I, and i think to your point i think the league is probably getting to a point now where they have enough data to realize yeah. that and understand the importance of scheduling i also know that scheduling is its own beast in itself right and right time zones and all of all that stuff especially throwing covid and all that kind of stuff now with what's going on <laughs> But I think yeah. that is forcing everybody to refine their systems and processes so that when things get back to normal, whatever that is, right, um, yeah. it's with the full understanding of like, okay, what's valuable, what's most important, where do we need to invest our time, where do we need to invest our resources, and um, what's going to get us the best return. I thought that was the right decision from the referee. Alashe got body position, and Gerard wasn't going to get the ball. Good call from the referee. Robbie Keane looking to get rid of Victor Bernalves. Good ball played up top. Good opportunity now for San Aniasi. Played inside. What a ball! The shot! This time he won't miss! Goal! What a finish! That was a America. great start to our conversation with Quincy Ameriqua. It was great to get to know him a bit more and begin to ask some of these interesting questions. And he had some great answers. Yeah. You know, it was great. It was a fun time. He actually had to go because he had a meeting for black players for change. So we completely understand there's bigger pressing needs on his hands. So thank you for your time. Um, We're probably going to have a part two. So um, guys, please look out for it. If not next week, the week after it, um, and he'll get to all your fan questions and some of the questions that we had. Um, for him as well we kind of just went over the introduction as you can tell but he had a lot of great insight and we actually got into some conversation about the mls as a whole but it's going to be probably more quakes oriented podcast the next time he's on right and we appreciate all the fan questions and we will be hopefully recording part two either later this week or the beginning of next week Whatever the case may be, whatever fan questions we've already received prior to this recording session on Tuesday afternoon, those are the ones that we are going to use for part two. I know some of you who maybe forgot to submit questions may want to in the next few days, but since we already have a large amount of questions, we don't want part two to be too long either. So we appreciate your support and there will be other opportunities to submit questions. If we can fit it in, we're going to try our best. Um, Let's say Quincy knocks them out really quickly, but if we can't get to it, we can't get to it. Like I've been said. Right. Okay. All right. Well, thanks guys for tuning into our uh, podcast with Quincy Ameriqua. Um, We will be back with more. Um, We're going to go ahead and be back for our usual podcast this Friday and if you guys have any questions or want to be on, on that podcast with a question, just let us know. All right, go Quakes. And oh, also yeah. <laughs> we want to thank again, thank our sponsor again, Roughneck Scarves, official scarf supplier to MLS, USL, and U.S. Soccer. Get custom scarves for your group or team at roughneckscarves.com. That's R-U-F-F-N-E-C-K scarves.com.
tired of the same old uniforms and cookie cutter templates from Nike and Adidas? For sure. Look for a unique, completely custom kit for your youth club, Sunday league squad, adult, or even pro team. Icarus okay. FC can help you create the kit of your dreams at an affordable price. Let them help you design your new kit today at IcarusFC.com. I know you have some great ideas for <laughs> designs, Fabi, so I'm sure you'll go to IcarusFC.com to sh- share your ideas with the world do i i'm already on it okay i'm already on that <laughs> <laughs> there you have it so don't forget follow tectonic takes oh yeah myself at ivan <laughs> ornelis too and fabi at the only quaker on twitter you can also check us out on patreon and youtube our links will be in the description below yep and be sure to interact with us on social media we're always happy to talk quakes as well as soccer in general with you and hope you enjoy your day yeah have a good one guys and go quakes go quakes